Hi everyone. For today's lesson, we are going to learn about geometric proofs. Our I can statements for today is for you to be able to say, I can write proofs using geometric theorems and logic to show special relationships between points, lines, and planes are true. So we are going to be proving special relationships. I'm going to give you some information, and then from there, I'm gonna ask you to prove that a statement is true about the relationship between points, lines, and planes. For today's lesson, you will need the following materials. First of all, you will need to have printed out your cutouts for geometric proofs, that's day three. You will need scissors, you will need a glue stick, you will need some color, like highlighters, for emphasis and something to write with. Please feel free to pause the, the video and gather these, uh, these materials before you get started with your lesson. All right, let's go ahead and get started. So before we um, get started with actually doing some proofs, we have some definitions that I want to make sure that I talk about with you guys. And the first one is the definition of a theorem. And what a theorem is, is it's a statement that can be proven. True. A statement that can be proven true. So a very common theorem that we use a lot um, that you guys are probably most familiar with would be the Pythagorean theorem. And what the Pythagorean theorem says is that if you have a right triangle and the side lengths are called A, B, and C, it is always true that A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared if A, B, and C represent the side lengths of a right triangle, where C represents the hypotenuse, the hypotenuse and A and B represents the side lengths. So the Pythagorean theorem is a statement that we can prove true. The reason why it's a theorem, though, is because Maybe there exists some triangles that we haven't come up with yet where this statement is false, but overall, in general, it has been a proven true time and time again, and therefore, it is considered a theorem. This is different compared to a postulate. A postulate A postulate is a statement that is accepted as true. What this means is that you don't have to prove its truth anymore. Mathematicians all agree that this statement is always true no matter what. An example of a postulate that we've already talked about is the segment addition postulate. We've also talked about the angle addition postulate. And remember that the segment addition postulate says that if you have a segment that is broken apart into smaller segments, let's call that segment uh, AB with C being in between, we would say that segment AC plus segment CB is equal to AB. This is where you have part plus another part equals the whole. We are going to be working with the segment addition postulate as well as the angle addition postulate in this unit as well as the next unit. Remember that this represented part plus part equals whole. So that is considered a postulate. A property 
is a characteristic of a geometric figure. And we have a couple of properties that I want to make sure that I talk about. Whenever we're working with geometric figures, so if you wouldn't mind taking out the cutout that says reflexive property of congruence and transitive property of congruence, a property is a characteristic of figures. So the reflexive property of congruence is a characteristic of something that you can do with segments. And in this case, we're going to be talking about angles as well. So this was this is a little bit different compared to our last lesson. Our last lesson, we were talking about reflexive property of equality and transitive property of equality. And now the word that is different is congruence. Both of these are dealing with congruence. Notice that I don't have um, numbers in here. Numbers cannot be congruent. They, numbers are equal to each other. So, but geometric figures, they can be congruent to each other. So just like before, we had the reflexive property, which is known as the mirror property is what I called it. And when it comes to segment length, it says for any segment, segment AB, notice that there's lines above. We can say that segment AB is congruent to segment AB. They are congruent to each other because what we are saying is that a, uh, any segment is congruent to itself. They both will have the same length, but we're talking about it as a name. So it needs a line above. because we're talking about a relationship between segments. And because we have a line above, we have to have a congruent symbol. No line above, no congruent symbol, we use an equal symbol. And what this is essentially saying is that segment AB is congruent to itself. And there's going to be some times where we are going to be working with uh, segments and like where a segment is overlapping with shapes. So for example, we might be working with uh, overlapping triangles and they both share a segment. Let's say that we're talking about segment AB and we wanna talk about a relationship between our two triangles. We can say that segment AB is congruent to segment AB because they share a common side. So you'll want to look for a common side that is shared, a common side or a shared side. And that's primarily when we use the reflexive property of congruence. So that's where we're gonna be heading into. The next one is the reflexive property of congruence says that for any angle A, Angle A is congruent to angle A. Notice that I don't have an M right in front. So I'm gonna write no M. And that M once again represents measure. So when because there is no M in front, we are not interested in looking at the actual degree of the angle. We're just talking about a relationship that the angle has with, itse with itself. And any angle is congruent to itself. So any angle is congruent to itself and any segment is congruent to itself. So if you see an angle and they're talking about angle A, angle A would be congruent to itself and once again, there's going to be a time where we might be talking about an overlapping shape or an overlapping angle. So in this problem that I'm about to draw, here's A, B, C, D and E, both triangles, but the triangles that I'm about to show you. So we have a big triangle of ACD and a triangle that's a very tiny that's on the inside of ABE. Both of these triangles share angle A. So if we wanted to talk about a relationship, both of these triangles share angle A, so therefore angle A is congruent to itself. Once again, you want to look for a common or shared angle 
if you see a common or shared angle, then what that means is that we are going to probably use the reflexive property of congruence. The transitive property of congruence is very similar to what we had before. It is the triangle property. So that means that you need three pieces. And it says for any segments, segment AB, segment CD, and segment EF, if segment AB is congruent to segment CD, and segment CD is congruent to segment EF, that means that segment AB needs to be congruent to segment EF. So there's always gonna be three pieces of information. One that's going to be your connector piece. So the connector piece in this case was segment CD. Both of these statements had segment CD in them. And we were able to see that segment AB and segment CD had the same length segment CD and segment EF have the same length. So therefore, AB and EF have to have the same length. I am not interested in the actual number, just a relationship. So we wanna say then segment AB has to be congruent to segment EF. And that would be our final statement. The same thing is true for angle measures. If you have three different angles and you're told if angle A is congruent to angle B and angle B is congruent to angle C, then you can say that angle A has to be congruent to angle C. In this problem, we have a connector angle of angle B. Both of these statements have an angle B in them. And so therefore, notice that in our final statement, both of them do not have the angle B in them. We're, we're talking about the other pieces. Angle A has to be congruent to angle C. Once again, I am not interested in the exact measure. I am just interested in the relationship. That is the reason why we use a congruent symbol instead of us using an equal sign. When you get a chance, go ahead and paste this into our notebook. And then I'm gonna go ahead and flip the page so that I can complete our proof. And that will be the end of this lesson. All right, on the next page. We're gonna take out our proof. This is our geometric two column proof. The very first proof that we are going to have working with geometric figures. And I'm just gonna immediately glue this right into my notebook. So in this proof, you're going to see a given and you're gonna see a statement that you'll need to prove. So in our given statement, we are told that AC is equal to AB plus AB. And what we need to prove is that AB has to equal BC. Now think about this. If AC, which is the whole, is equal to just AB, plus AB again, and we know that part plus part equals whole as well, somehow we're gonna have to connect that AB and BC have to be the same. That's what we have to show. So it's gonna require us to be working with equations, the segment addition postulate, and um, also working with uh, our algebraic properties that we learned about in our last lesson. So whenever we're starting off with a proof, we always write down what is given to us. So what is given to us in this case is AC equals AB plus AB. And we write this because it is given. And all of the proofs that I'm going to give you that are geometric, at least in this first unit, I will give you all of the blanks at the bottom that will tell you what, the, what you will need to fill in. So, so far, I've used given. Now look at the next statement. It says AB plus BC equals AC. 
AB is right here. That's our part. And BC, that's from here to here. That's another part. And AC is the whole. What I'm writing down right here, this is thinking. This is planning. This is sketching. I need to see this thinking when you are doing your homework. That's my way of knowing that you weren't necessarily copying the key, but you were trying to figure out how to do these problems. So what is part plus part equals whole? Well, we already talked about that. That is the segment addition postulate. And that is the reason why we are writing this down. So now look at what we have here. AC equals AB plus AB. And AB plus BC also equals AC. Look at what we have. We have two things are equal to AC. And in our next line, A plus B has to equal A plus B. So look at what we have. We have one statement is equal to another statement. A third statement is equal to the first statement. If A equals B and B equals C, then A equals C. What we have here is an example of the transitive property of equality. It's equality because of the fact that we're working with an equal sign. So I really want you to look at this. AC is equal to two things here. AC is equal to AB plus AB. AB plus BC is also equal to AC. So it's equal to two pieces. Therefore, we're gonna use the transitive property of equality to make our next statement. I'm gonna explain this really, really quick one more time using simpler words. I'm gonna rewrite this as five is equal to two plus three. Let's pretend as if that's what the first statement said. And then the second statement said, well, four plus one is equal to five. So can't we say if 5 is equal to 2 plus 3 and 4 plus 1 is equal to 5, can't we say that 4 plus, I'm sorry, 2 plus 3 is equal to 4 plus 1? Yeah, they both are equivalent to 5. So yes, they are both equal to each other. And this right here is an example of the transitive property of equality. So I always want you to look for that relationship because I think that that's probably one of the most challenging relationships to recognize. So I want you to always look for that connector piece where we've used the same segment or angle or whatever it is that we're talking about twice and then it suddenly goes away as a connection. That's gonna be the transitive property of equality. Now look what happens. We have AB plus AB and AB plus BC, and suddenly we're left with AB and equals BC. So what did we do here? Well, it looks like we lost an AB on both sides. And when you do that, when you subtract AB on both sides, AB goes away on both sides, leaving us with AB has to equal BC, and that is the subtraction property of equality. And this thinking that I'm showing, these notes, this is what I would like to see in your homework whenever you are doing these problems. That is the end of today's lesson. If you have any questions over anything that I just talked about, please feel free to email me. Otherwise, I hope you have a wonderful day.